Onze volgende spreker is uh, begonnen in de, in de software, uh, softwarewereld. Uh, jaren geleden vroeg hij mij of ik het wel eens had gehoord van het bedrijf Atlassian. Nou, dat kende ik, want ik had op mijn uh, werk wel eens gewerkt met uh, Confluence en Jira. Dus meneer ging werken voor, uh, voor Atlassian. En Atlassian had toen alleen een, uh, een kantoor in Sydney. Dus hij heeft zijn boeltje gepakt en is in Sydney gaan wonen. Hij heeft die poosje gewoond. Dan is hij voor het, uh, voor, ook voor Atlassian naar het nieuwe kantoor verhuisd in San Francisco. Waar hij jarenlang heeft gewerkt. Hij heeft onder andere geprogrammeerd aan uh, Bitbucket. Dat mensen hier, sommigen hier vast wel kennen. Um, hij heeft een paar jaar geleden overstap gemaakt van, uh, van, het software, van de zuivere softwarewereld naar, de, naar, een, naar, naar Ghost. Een bedrijf dat uh, kits maakt om gewone auto's om te toveren in zelfrijdende auto's. En daar kan hij in, uh, met, niet alleen met software in aanraking, maar ook met de hardware. En dat is een beetje een hobby van hem geworden. Hij is uh, thuis aan het, uh, aan het prutsen gegaan, aan het solderen gegaan. Hij heeft een, een eigen setje Tetris consoles gemaakt waar hij uh, met zijn zoontje mee speelt. En uh, vervolgens kwam hij tot de conclusie van ja, al die componenten die je gebruikt, die zou je ook eigenlijk zelf moeten kunnen bouwen. Dus uh, daar gaat hij ons vandaag over vertellen. Dit is, uh, ik geef het woord aan, aan mijn broer Erik van Zeist. Ja, dankjewel Laat. Doet, doen deze het? Ja, hij is aan hè? Ja. Uh, ja, dankjewel Hans. Um, I will... Also going to do the uh, the talk in English. Um, the uh, I understand that everyone in the uh, in the room here today with us probably uh, speaks Dutch as as do I. But uh, the talks are all being recorded and uh, put online after the uh, the conference uh, to you know, reach a wider audience. And uh, I think we might be able to reach a, the the widest audience if we do it in English. Um, and with that out of the way, um, yeah, I want to I want to thank you for coming. Uh, it's a, bit, a talk that might take you a little bit out of your, um, I'm assuming, mostly sort of software systems uh, comfort zone. Um, in, uh, and I want to take you on a bit of a, a tour of uh, open source hardware in uh, silicon chip design. Um, I don't necessarily have great credentials. Uh, I'm not a hardware designer um, by trade. I'm a software engineer. Um, but as a software engineer, I... Um, you know, I have seen the, uh, the transformation of the, uh, the software industry in the past, you know, three decades or so from um, being fairly proprietary focused to what we have today where, you know, open source is at the, uh, at the heart of everything. Um, and that didn't happen overnight. Um, and I actually, I want to take you back in time uh, two decades, 22 years, to, uh, to back to 2000 and, uh, and let Eric Raymond speak for a second. It was at Agenda 2000, and uh, one of the people who was there was Craig Mundy, who is some kind of high monkey monkey at Microsoft. I think uh, Vice President of Consumer Products or something like that. And uh, I hadn't actually met him. I, I, I bumped into him at an elevator, in an elevator. And uh, I went to his bed and said, ah, I see you work for Microsoft. And he looked back at me and said, oh yeah, and what do you do? And I thought he seemed just a, a, some sort of a tad dismissive. I mean, here's the archetypal you know, guy in a suit looking at a scruffy hacker. And so I gave him the thousand yard stare and said, I'm your worst nightmare. Yeah, so this is a, a fragment from the uh, uh, Revolution OS, a uh, documentary from 2001. And it's about Linux, uh, it's about uh, the open source movement. Um, and it was made at a, uh, at a at a point of the late 90s, early 2000s, where uh, open source had, I think, um, had reached a certain level of maturity where um, everybody, including the industry, I think, had uh, come to realize that you know this wasn't gonna go away. It was only gonna you know pick up more steam, um, and uh, and it would have a, an ever greater impact on the uh, on the software industry. And that that sort of optimism, I I remember it from being in the industry, you know, back in. In the late 90s, um, like there was a, was a lot of optimism around uh, open source, about Linux. Uh, it was in the news and everything. It was new, and, and the, the documentary really sort of captures that moment. It's a freely available um, documentary. It's on YouTube. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you uh, you give it a watch. Um, and you know, Eric Raymond, he, uh, you know, he says to the this Microsoft guy, you know, I'm your worst nightmare. Uh, presumably, because you know he uh, he can see you know, the open source movement uh, going after Microsoft's uh, business models, 
Um, and, you know, that sure happened. Um, but I, I don't think it turned out to be a nightmare, though. Um, you know, 22 years ago, Microsoft was the, the largest software company in the world. Today, I'm guessing Microsoft is still very much the largest software company in the world. Um, and so, you know, it didn't turn out to be a, a nightmare. The, um, uh, the industry adapted, everybody adapted, and, uh, and in the end, I think it was a win for, for everyone involved. Um, now, you know, software isn't, doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? Um, like, lots of software is open these days. Every uh, piece of software is written today is mostly consists uh, of open source. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, software needs to run, you know, on hardware. And, um, and so it's important, I think, if you want to have open systems that we don't sort of arbitrarily stop at the, uh, the software boundary. Um, like today, you can, you can build a, a desktop computer or a server and run it with exclusively uh, open source software and be very uh, productive. Uh, but as soon as you dig under the kernel, uh, you're going to run into uh, binary firmware blobs uh, that control the underlying hardware, which is very, very closed. Uh, silicon chips, um, such as, for instance, you know, this one, you know, fairly new, uh, really impressive uh, SOC from, uh, from Apple uh, that is in the, uh, in the latest uh, like MacBooks that they sell, is, uh, is, is spectacular in many, many ways. It's like 10 CPUs, 32 GPUs, uh, tons of other stuff. There's neural cores in there. Uh, you know, almost 60 billion transistors in an, like an area like this big. It's absolutely amazing. But the only thing open about this, uh, you know, amazing piece of technology is the, uh, the instruction set, which is, you know, the ARM instruction set so that we can write software for it. Um, but that's about it. Like, we don't know how it works, right? Like, we can't really be sure that um, it does what we assume that it does. And, that it's us who controls it, as opposed to you know something or someone else at the end of the day. And you know that sort of trust issue might be uh, a factor why uh, Western governments uh, tend to be reluctant to uh, adopt, for instance, I don't know, like uh, Chinese hardware for uh, critical infrastructure. Um, yeah, and I'm assuming that you know, the opposite might be true as well. Like, this stuff is very, very close and very proprietary. And it also hampers education, right? Um, like, there is uh, a tremendous amount of educational material and software and tooling available to get people to program, right? And we, we target kids at every younger ages because we, we find it very important that people, you know, pick up those skills. But with regards to hardware design, it's very, very different. And... Um, like I think uh, some of the reasons that the, uh, the hardware industry and you know, particularly chip design is so closed and proprietary uh, might have something to do with the, the manufacturing process of uh, silicon chips uh, as well as the, the business models that have evolved in the, uh, in the industry. Because manufacturing chips is, uh, that's like mind-bogglingly complex and interesting. Um, the like the latest CPUs, like for instance, something like this, um, in uh, in sort of the the latest generation, uh, like Nvidia GPUs, for instance, and you know the the SOCs in your in your flagship phones are um, uh, are possible really only because of uh, you know advancements in uh, in physics, material science, um, and even quantum mechanics uh, comes into the picture. Uh, for uh, uh, chip manufacturing. So to give you a very brief lay of the land in terms of uh, fabrication of silicon chips, um, like we make silicon chips on these uh, you know, wafers, these silicon wafers, they're disks of very, very pure silicon that we can turn into uh, semiconducting material. And if we do that properly, then we can make uh, things like transistors uh, on the disk. And, uh, the way that that is done is by 
uh, coating the, uh, the silicon wafer uh, in a chemical uh, known as a photoresist, uh, which when exposed to light, which we do through a, a photographic mask where we project an image onto it, uh, wherever the, uh, the light hits the photoresist, it reacts and uh, we can then uh, etch into the underlying material or we can deposit new materials uh, in those places such as, for instance, metal uh, to create uh, conducting paths um, or uh, oxide to create, uh, you know, uh, the opposite. And so the way that we, re that we repeat this several times and so we can grow layer upon layer. And uh, what you get uh, then slowly, it's a very long process, you have to process a die many, many times. Uh, you can build layer upon layer upon layer where typically at the bottom layer you end up with the transistors, like many in the you know, case of that Apple chip, you know, also almost 60 billion transistors. And then you've got layers on top of it that provide uh, metal mashes of interconnecting wires. Yeah. This is a 3D rendering of a real chip, um, like this scale, or rather, you know, obviously tiny, but the, uh, this is what it would look like if you were to zoom in on this level. Uh, and you can see, you can obviously see the, like the different layers that we have. The bottom layer, there's transistors, and then uh, there's many layers on top that uh, very carefully and very meticulously connect all these millions or in billions of uh, transistors. And now the, um, like the scale of these, these wires and, and interconnects and everything um, can be on the, in the order of uh, tens of nanometers. And that is, that's very, very small, obviously. To put it in perspective, uh, that's smaller than you know, certain molecules. Uh, a water molecule or a CO2 molecule is a very, very small molecule. Uh, it's about 0.3 nanometer uh, wide. And so we're we're approaching sort of the order of uh, individual molecules. And uh, creating those kinds of patterns uh, with accuracy and being able to repeat it when you do another layer on top of it later on, and so you have to have your alignment uh, on that level as well, is incredibly difficult. The, um, the machines that we have to make to do the photolithography are these uh, you know, beasts. And with every generation, um, they become more capable, uh, but also more expensive and more complicated. Now the, the latest generation, so the, the smallest chips, uh, are made by machines from ASML uh, here in Veldhoven. And uh, ASML is currently the only company in the world that is able to build the machines that can do the, you know, the the really small, they call them seven nanometer uh, chips. Uh, it's called a process, process node, these machines. And so with every generation, we get a new process node and that determines the, the capability um, of the chips that we can make. Now, because it's so difficult, um, there's a lot of specialization here. Uh, so ASML builds these machines, but ASML does not make chips. ASML sells these machines to factories, to chip factories. Uh, known as foundries, and uh, they then uh, make chips for yet other companies. And so the factories themselves, they don't design chips, like Apple, for instance, would design chips, or NVIDIA would design chips, um, and then uh, they would go to a foundry, um, for instance, uh, TSMC in Taiwan, which is um, maybe the largest, most sophisticated chip factory in the world, um, to, uh, to have them produced. Now, the process between chip design on the left and, uh, and being able to produce uh, photographic masks that you can put in one of these machines uh, is a, uh, a very interesting, very specialized process. Uh, you start on the left, you start with a high level hardware description language um, where you express the functionality of a chip it uh, looks a lot like regular code. It isn't, but it, you, would, you, you, you work with it in a similar kind of way. Um, so it's all text. And, uh, and then you run that through a, uh, what is known as a digital design flow, which is a toolkit of, of, uh, uh, of tools, a bit like a compiler, uh, where you, know, you put in high-level language on one side, and then it compiles it down to 
uh, machine code for a very specific type of architecture, very specific type of CPU, right? That's what a compiler does. And uh, these things kind of do the same thing where they take this high level uh, hardware design and then they compile it down to, um, well, logic gates. And then they, you know, they place logic gates on the die and they connect uh, wires to it. Uh, and it, in order to be able to do that, uh, that process needs a lot of information uh, about the, uh, the fab, like the foundry, the, the process node, the machine that is gonna make the chips. Um, because you need to know like the tolerances and the like the, the smallest things that it can make uh, realistically and all of these things and so you need a ton of information about the the processor node and you need to feed that to the uh, like the the software toolkit and this is where things become tricky because uh, a a PDK that's the that's the information about the process node uh, the PDK is provided by the foundry because the foundry has the machines um, and they they guard that uh, in the sense that it's hard to get access to. Um, when, you, when, you, when you do get access to it, you have to assign non-disclosure agreements, and so you probably can't share it. Uh, and so for individuals you know, like, like us, uh, it's just very, uh, very hard to approach this market. And then even if you have access to the, uh, the PDK, then you need the tooling uh, to you know, sort of compile your code into uh, something that you can be manufactured with that PDK, and uh, that stuff is uh, typically provided by companies like Cadence and Synopsys. Um, it's very enterprisey, and so it's a development environment that you install, uh, you know, on operating systems that, that they choose. Uh, you need licenses. Uh, often you need per seat licenses. It's all of this stuff is very proprietary, very closed, and very not for you know us, if you will. Um, that is changing. Uh, a lot of the steps in the digital design flow, like the parsing of these files, um, can be done with open source tools. Um, and so, but the last part, like having a, like a PDK, you can't really you know, fake that or, or, or change that. You just need the information about those machines. Um, and, uh, and, and a bit of a watershed moment, I think, happened uh, recently, uh, two years ago, when Google entered the arena and uh, Google has uh, teamed up with a real foundry, uh, Skywater in Minnesota, um, and uh, eFabless, a semiconductor uh, business in the Bay Area. And uh, they have created a completely open source PDK um, for Skywater's 130 nanometer process node. Um, and so with that and the open source tools that you know, largely already existed, uh, they were able to create an entire end-to-end -end, uh, digital design flow that is entirely open source. It doesn't rely on any, you know, commercial or, uh, or, or uh, you know, a corporate part, uh, and you can just run on your, on your, you know, your laptop. And um, if that wasn't enough, Google went a step further still and even set aside what I assume must be millions uh, to pay for actually you know, manufacturing chips that you know, come out of that design, right? Because the tooling might be free. Uh, going to you know, Minnesota and having your chips fabricated on a, on a, on a wafer costs real money, obviously. And so uh, Google is paying for that as well. Uh, Google is paying the cost for manufacturing these, uh, these chips for anyone uh, who wants to give this a go um, and, uh, and publishes their uh, chip designs as open source. Now, that's really, really cool, and I think a first ever. Uh, and so I wanted to give this a go. Um, I do not have a hardware background at all. I've never done anything like this. I didn't know about you know, hardware description languages, um, but I, uh, I didn't realize that there was a growing community around all of this. And, uh, and so I, I signed up last year, and, uh, and with uh, a lot of help from community members, I uh, was actually able within you know, two and a half or three months to um, design an, an ASIC, uh, so a silicon chip from scratch uh, that does the noble thing of playing Pong. Um, it has a, a VGA output uh, from the chip, so it speaks VGAs. You can hook it up to a VGA monitor. Uh, you hook up uh, rotary dials, two rotary dials, so you can multiplayer uh, Pong on the, on the screen, um, in, uh, and there you go. Now, 
building something like this would be fairly trivial with you know, not much code in Python or something else. Uh, but it, it's important to realize that there is no code at all here involved. Right? There's no CPU, there's nothing. Uh, this is all hardwired silicon uh, on a die um, that can do one thing, and that is play Pong. And the, um, uh, the chips have uh, started to come back since then. Uh, it's been a year, uh, so it's been you know, a bit of a slow process, but the chips have come back. And uh, I have them here. This is what they look like. It's obviously, they're tiny. If you're interested, you can come in after the talk and check them out. Uh, they're bare dies, meaning that these are the things that are cut out of the wafer at the end of the uh, production process before they normally get packaged into you know, plastic. Uh, uh, packets as, as you know them. So this is the kind of stuff you would find inside uh, a chip if you open it up. And uh, I just think it's really cool to have been able to uh, you know, design something and then you get this back from an actual chip factory. How do you pick it up from the yeah, so, so that, that involves uh, soldering. Uh, on, the, uh, on the back of the chips, um, uh, you, can, you, can, you can check it out later. On the back of the chips, there's a, uh, a grid of tiny little solder balls. Like they're extremely tiny, but it, you know, with a microscope, you can see them. And, um, and you basically solder them upside down onto a circuit board, um, which is a challenge all in itself, obviously. How many chips have you burned? Uh, I haven't started soldering them yet, so <laughs> none yet. <laughs> um, no, not really. Not re well, to some degree, but not really. And uh, in part, that is because you know, like, this contains a design that you know I made. Nobody in the factory knows how this stuff is supposed to work, or you know, like what the signals mean and everything. And so, um, so some of the infrastructure on the chip um, is tested, but not the part that I did. Um, so there's a real chance that it doesn't work. But then still, I have a nice chip, right? Anyway, that didn't make me a hardware designer. I'm not a hardware designer. This is, this is a really fun project, and I, I did learn a ton. Um, but one thing that I, I take away from it is that as a software developer, like we're pretty privileged in terms of our development workflow. But I can make a one-line change in, a, in, a, in, in my code and you know, recompile and run it to see what it does, um, you know, usually in a matter of seconds. Uh, trying to do that with you know, chips, they set you back months and tens of thousands of dollars. And so instead, uh, chip designers uh, rely heavily on uh, simulation of their circuits, um, as well as uh, a particularly interesting kind of chip uh, known as a, an FPGA, uh, a field programmable gate array. Now, it's known as configurable silicon. Um, I don't know if you've heard of FPGA. Some probably have, others maybe haven't. Um, if you have heard of it, maybe that's been in the context of something like uh, cryptocurrency mining. Um, but they're, they're very uh, versatile chips. Let me try to explain what they are using an analogy. Like imagine you have a, a breadboard, electronics breadboard, right? And it's filled with transistors, just bare transistors. And it's really, really big, bigger than this. But there's no wires anywhere, and so nothing is connected. So you've got this big breadboard with a grid of transistors without any connect connection, so it doesn't do anything. But on the side, you've got a big pile of wire, and so with that wire, you can make any connection between any pair of transistors. And um, if you consider that you know, any digital chip at the lowest level is just transistors, and that the difference between two chips is not that they use transistors, but is the way that their transistors are connected. The connectivity makes the the difference that defines what the chip is. And so with a breadboard like this, if it's large enough and if you have enough wire, um, you can make any circuit, any digital circuit. You can, you can make a Pentium processor with this, right? It may not run as fast as the original, but uh, you could. And that's uh, essentially what an FPGA is. An FPGA on the lowest level is a huge grid of uh, generic logic components, uh, but they're not connected. Um, and then when you turn it on, you provide it with a, a configuration file or like a netlist or a bitstream in jargon um, where you tell the FPGA which connections to make between which of the thousands or millions of uh, logic components. And then it becomes that circuit, right? And so you can make it 
a Pentium processor, or you could make it um, an MPEG encoder or cryptocurrency miner, or uh, a game of Pong. Right, the video I showed you with Pong on the screen, that was running on an FPGA. Um, I made that recording before the chip was ever sent off to the factory. And so while I was iterating on it, I used an FPGA to do so. Um, and so they're, they're very valuable uh, devices for uh, in the digital design. And, and so therefore, it's interesting to look at uh, how FPGAs are used. And it's a little bit of a similar story to uh, uh, silicon or ASIC design in that you start off with high-level uh, hardware description language. These are the identical files that you would use if you wanted to make a, an actual chip. And then on the other hand, you have an FPGA, uh, a chip. And, uh, and so you need to compile, if you will, synthesize uh, your logic design into a bitstream that can be loaded onto a particular FPGA. And FPGAs are, or at least the bitstream format of an FPGA is a little bit maybe like a, uh, uh, an instruction set of a CPU in the sense that two different FPGAs will have a different uh, uh, bitstream format. And so you need to compile it down to a very specific target FPGA. But the problem is that the most popular FPGAs in the market today are manufactured by just a few companies. And um, they treat their FPGAs as uh, very closed and proprietary products. Uh, they don't publish the bitstream format, which means that you know, if you just have an FPGA chip, you won't be able to do anything with it. You won't be able to you know, program it. Uh, and instead, you'll have to use their proprietary tooling uh, to be able to uh, get anything onto the FPGA. And uh, all the vendors do the same thing. So you have to download, well, get licenses for their, uh, for their software, run that on you know, typically uh, Windows, as far as I've seen so far. Uh, and uh, and you, you put your design in, and what comes out, you, know, you have to trust that that accurately represents you know, the stuff that you put in. And uh, so obviously, we like a, uh, an alternative open source flow that, it, well, first of all, is free, um, but also can maybe target uh, FPGA, FPGAs from different vendors, right? So if I have a, a Xilinx FPGA, I couldn't use, uh, you know, uh, uh, Lattice's uh, software, for instance. And so it creates sort of a natural uh, lock-in here, this whole uh, industry. And again, a lot has... Uh, been built as open source. Like some of these steps are identical to the ASIC process. We have to pro parse these files to begin with. That's all the same. Um, but the last part, like being able to write a bitstream, uh, requires you to understand the bitstream format, and that isn't published. And so that needed to be reverse engineered. And um, reverse engineering that bitstream is really hard. Uh, it's a little bit like um, uh, writing a compiler for a CPU that you don't have the instruction set for, uh, right? Where you probably don't even know if it's an 8-bit or a 32-bit CPU, or whether it's uh, a little endian or big endian. Uh, but you have to write a C compiler for it. Right? It's, uh, but some very, very smart people uh, years ago were able to uh, crack the, the bitstream for a number of FPGAs, <coughs> commercial FPGAs. And uh, so that completed the... Uh, uh, the flow, and so today, uh, for several FPGAs, uh, popular ones, we have a completely open source uh, synthesis flow, uh, which is really, really cool because that also grew the community, right? Because it's much easier to get into uh, using FPGAs and, and digging around with them. You don't have to invest in it. You don't have to work for you know a large company that does these things. You can do it on your own. And um, uh, since then, the, uh, a number of uh, parties in the industry, um, I think, have changed a little bit, and that there appears to be more of a, a positive attitude towards uh, this, this kind of tooling, luckily. Um, but I, I think we also have to realize that uh, the, the vendors have an incentive to uh, maintain their uh, proprietary tooling, in part because controlling the entire development flow um, and tying you into a particular chip that is theirs uh, also facilitates uh, a marketplace for uh, commercial 
IP or hardware libraries. You know, to explain about hardware libraries, if you look at software development, right, if we if you write a non-trivial piece of software today, um, we end up with uh, something that is 90% open source libraries and you know 10% or less of your own code that you know, creates the product that you needed. Um, but if you're going to do a new project, uh, you're not going to write your own uh, HTTP client libraries or or TensorFlow or you know an operating system kernel. Right? You pull all of that in as external libraries. And in, in case of software, that's all open source these days. Now with hardware, it turns out to be very similar. If you're going to do a non-trivial hardware design, so not you know, Pong or Monastic, but something more serious, like here's a random microcontroller, uh, the block diagram of the die, um, and, and every little block here represents a, a subsystem of the chip. And, uh, and so you'll see that. Um, you know, a microcontroller consists of tons of stuff, like a CPU, obviously, and so there's RAM, there's ROM, there's a memory management unit, uh, there's DMA controller, you know, a USB interface, a network interface, uh, Ethernet, uh, LCD screen interface, all that kind of stuff um, you need in this product, but, you know, it doesn't, it's not a key differentiator. You're not going to write it yourself. So you pull these things in um, from, you know, external parties. That's libraries. Um, in the industry, I think they refer to them as IP cores or IP blocks, but they're effectively hardware libraries. And what the FPGA vendors have done is in their proprietary development environment, they've created these curated um, hardware library marketplaces. Five minutes? And, um, and so, it's very easy for you to you know, pull in a USB controller or something like that, and, uh, but you don't get the source code of any of that. Typically, uh, you get just enough information to connect up the wires in your, on your chip uh, so that you can use it. Um, but when you serialize, when you synthesize it and put it on the FPGA, then at the last bit, uh, the pre-compiled binary bit stream for that particular component gets merged into your design and, uh, and you know, uh, it runs. But uh, typically, uh, you have to get a license for every component, you have to pay for every component. Um, it uh, typically locks you in to a particular development flow, to a, an FPGA, and so it's very, it feels very old from a software perspective, I think. Uh, there's lots of fragmentation, there's li binary licensing, uh, it's restrictive, uh, and so we need open source IP cores if you wanna have a, a healthy, uh, you know, open, uh, silicon chip design community. And there's one particular uh, IP core I want to highlight specifically, and that's a CPU. Like a CPU at the end of the day is also just a subsurf. Um, and, uh, and, and CPUs are also pulled in as external libraries, oftentimes in chip designs. In fact, CPUs are everywhere. All of these things contain CPUs. Um, and when I say CPU, what I mean is the like the part that reads the stored program, executes the instructions, and then you know, manipulates memory, right? So not the big Intel chip in your desktop, because that does a lot more than just that. I'm talking about just the CPU part. Like an SD card, for instance, contains a CPU that bridges between the host computer and the, the non-volatile memory chips on the, uh, on the card. Um, but also a COVID test, for instance, or at least this particular COVID tester, uh, contains a 64 megahertz 32-bit ARM CPU to interpret the result, and then you toss it out. Uh, that same stuff is used in some uh, pregnancy tests. Um, but even chips themselves that are, you know, themselves not microprocessors often contain a CPU somewhere on the die uh, internally to uh, facilitate housekeeping stuff or communication between different subsystems and stuff like that. And so CPUs are incredibly important in... Um, a CPU is defined by its instruction set, right? And obviously x86 and ARM are the, are the most common well-known instruction sets today, probably. Um, but while the instruction set is documented, of course, they're not free and open, right? I couldn't go and implement my own ARM CPU. Well, I couldn't anyway, but there are people that you know, technically could, um, but then in order for you to be able to you know, put it in a product and sell the product, for instance, you'll have to get a license uh, from ARM. And 
I don't know what the licenses cost. They don't publish them, but I believe it's in the order of millions of dollars. And so ARM or x86 or any sort of non-open instruction set is kind of a no-go for uh, open hardware designs. And so we need a, a true open instruction set, and a number exists, and the one that is, uh, has sort of floated to the top of the pile, if you will, um, is, uh, is RISC-V, which is a, uh, an entirely open and free instruction set uh, architecture uh, for 3264, 128-bit microprocessors. Uh, it originally came from UC Berkeley, um, but uh, it's a, a huge project with a, a lot of steam behind it um, and has seen a lot of adoption in the industry as well. And so today you can actually buy RISC-V chips uh, from commercial vendors, uh, all the way from low-end microcontrollers, so that's the kind of chips that you might find in you know, a COVID tester um, or your, your internet-connected washing machine, for instance, uh, all the way to you know, higher-end SOCs that uh, might run a desktop computer. Compiler support is also excellent. Uh, GCC and LLVM uh, can both uh, churn out RISC-V object code just fine. And as a result, they, um, like they've started to appear in lots of places because you can get, uh, there's many open source implementations that you can just you know, pull uh, uh, from a third party that you can freely use and distribute just you know, like open source software. And so, for instance, they making their way into HSMs, like hardware security modules, which is, you know, a perfect application for them. Now, most of this I didn't really know until recently. As I said, I'm a software developer, um, and I didn't really know FPGAs, and um, as a software engineer, I kind of treated hardware as, you know, sort of an opaque block that, you know, I program on top of. Um, but it turns out hardware design and, and silicon chip design uh, is a lot more accessible today than it was, you know, a generation ago. Uh, and in fact, if I'm able to, you know, design it and, and have an entire chip fabricated myself uh, in two and a half months, then, you know, obviously that bodes well for the future of innovation uh, in terms of people that do know what they're, uh, what they're talking about. And so I think if we sort of apply the lessons of uh, the open source software transformation to uh, the hardware domain, uh, then we might perhaps come to a point where the boundary between hardware developer and software developer kind of blurs and uh, a full stack developer, a full stack engineer might come to include uh, the ability uh, to understand and study and perhaps even create custom hardware components for a product uh, if, that, if that makes sense without you know, vendor lock-in or, or high expenses or uh, uh, you know, licensing issues. And so, in fact, if we have a, a thriving uh, open source IP core uh, uh, environment where, you know, I can, I can pull in, uh, uh, you know, like a, a hardware library with a simple command line install command, like, you know, like I pip install a Python library or npm install a, a Node.js library in a new project, like that would be, that would be awesome. Uh, we're not quite there yet, um, but I think we're on the uh, on the right track, and uh, and it feels like perhaps we're at a bit of a, a point, like you know Eric Raymond was 22 years ago. And so with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, hopefully, you found it. <laughs> hopefully, you found it interesting. Um, maybe you're even inspired. Uh, I have collected a bunch of resources on this, uh, on this page because uh, I talked about a ton of stuff, very high level, and so there's, there's a lot there uh, that you can, uh, can look at. I think we have a few more minutes for questions. Yes, we do. In the back. Hi, uh, just a simple question that's been burning with me since halfway your talk. What's the batch size of the chips that you can order and what prices are involved? Right, so the, the, the program that my chip went through um, is, is known as a, a prototyping uh, shuttle. 
where uh, I think a single wafer is made, I believe, um, so this is not for high volume stuff. Uh, a single wafer is made, and I, I don't know how many chips come out of it, I think a hundred or something. And, uh, and so if you go through this Google program, Google e Fabulous program, you, uh, end up on a, you end up on a wafer, then I think you get a hundred chips back in the end. And uh, as I said, Google is paying for it at the moment, for anyone who, um, who makes a truly open source design. Um, you can also apply for it um, a, as a commercial entity that does not open source their design, and then you have to pay for it yourself. And in that case, I believe the cost for that shuttle is um, uh, $10,000, I think, which is, I don't know, it was less than I expected. Um, but So that's what you're looking at if you wanted to do this on a 130 nanometer process um, today. 130 nanometer, by the way, for comparison, that is, I believe, the Pentium 4 used. Right? So these days, like people say you have seven nanometer chips. It's not quite seven nanometer, but it's a lot smaller. Um, the, uh, this program uses a 130 nanometer uh, process node. Yeah, go ahead. Um, at the end, you talked about a library where you can pull stuff from into your design. Have you looked at opencourse.org? Yeah, so opencourse, as I said, there's a, I'll skip back to the end. I collected a bunch of uh, resources. Uh, opencourse is, is one site that um, it's existed for quite a while, which is a bit like, it's not quite a GitHub for uh, hardware, um, but it is, it's, a, it's a, a marketplace for free and open source um, uh, hardware cores, uh, open cores. And uh, so it's in my list, if I can get to the end. Uh, it's in my list, and, uh, and yes. Um, that said, however, um, open cores has a ton of stuff on there, especially lots of uh, CPU implementations and, and uh, uh, connectivity interfaces. Um, but a lot of it seems to be fairly stale. Um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, collabor active collaboration on them. Um, I wouldn't say it's a graveyard, because I'm certainly not qualified to say that. Um, but it, what it feels like a little bit, I mean, this being probably mostly a software uh, uh, audience, it feels a little bit like SourceForge versus GitHub, if you will, right? Um, it's important, but we can probably do better. And uh, so what I, like, ideally what I would like to see is open cores, but then um, more active. For that, obviously, we need a larger community. And so we need more people, you know, that, that do stuff with hardware. Um, and uh, more, I guess, collaboration features, like, if, like what pull requests did for uh, open source, online open source development were really, really uh, helpful. Um, and so, so yes, I know open course, there's other commercial similar kind of sites as well. Um, Fossey. Yep. Yeah, so there, there a lot of this stuff. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Like, but, so as I said, like, I think we're on, I think we're on a, a really good path. Um, the, the community is visibly growing. Um, and with a larger community and, and, you know, more people working on this stuff um, and, you know, tools that are freely available and, and, uh, and, you know, easy to get started with, it's hopefully inevitable that you would, will also see a, a more, a larger and more uh, robust collection of IP cores. But it's important, right? There's a lot of open source cores right now, but there are lots of things also that, as far as I'm aware, have no open source alternatives. Like, for instance, uh, LTE radio, um, uh, all of that stuff is uh, is proprietary right now, and so if you were to build a an open hardware phone like a, a purism uh, type thing, then um, as hard as you might try, you're still going to end up with entirely proprietary closed pieces of hardware in your device. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you all.